Namaste, Adya Shakti. Yeah. So uh, we meet again on the airwaves. Yes. And this time we are going to delve into one of my favorite uh, books that Ramana used, which is the Ribu Gita. Yes, we all have a lot of respect for Ribu Gita. Yes. And uh, today, the picture behind me is of Arunachala, of course, in the background. And close behind me is the tank where Ramana Maharshi completed his acts of renunciation uh, on his way to meet Arunachala in the big temple. And huh. when he came to this tank, then uh, he had a couple of rupees left, all of his money in the world. He threw that in the tank. He had a ruby earring and he threw that in his tank. And he was wearing a normal kind of cloth, a dhoti. And he thought that was more than he need. And he tore it in half and threw uh, half of it in the tank and then wound the others around his waist. And then uh, a barber who was nearby saw this... Uh, young Swami there and knew that he needed a shave and a haircut before he went to the temple. So Ramana uh, removed all his hair. The thing he didn't do that was preparation before you go to the temple is to take a bath. And uh, he, on his way to the temple, there was a sudden shower and uh, he got his bath completing all of the acts. And so, so whatever, whatever we're missing, our Nacho will supply that and support us. Yes, yes. And certainly that was a wonderful example. Uh. And so uh, this time we're going to talk about uh, the Ribu Gita, and if I can, let me put it up on screen. Okay. And let's get started. The Nataraj here is from uh, Nomi's Temple, the Sat Temple in Santa Cruz, California. And usually before uh, satsangs and holy events, this is decorated. It was done by a friend of mine named Jim Clark, not no relation. And uh, he uh, took it upon himself as his seva to decorate these murtis before each event. And I think Jim was a great example of what happens with karma yoga. Because after Jim had done service for a couple of years, then suddenly he became a bhakti and just he was just full of love and the love that. Uh, shined in his heart, you know, just was everywhere. Amazing. So yeah. uh, I like that just because that's an example of what you have been saying, how uh, karma yoga leads naturally to bhakti, which leads naturally to these other deep states. 
anyway, so here we go with the song of Ribu, and I just hit the wrong button. And first, we will start with uh, an introductory verse from the Sanskrit version of the Ribu Gita. And if you can offer us the translation. Yes, I just happen to have it here. <laughs> the first verse. Salutations to the Supreme Lord Shiva. The pure awareness in the sky of consciousness in the heart. By meditation on whom Ganesh Guha. Mother Shakti, who is the embodiment of Shiva's grace, and myriads of devas, saints, and devotees have attained their cherished goals. In the second verse, from the sky of consciousness of the heart springs forth the dancer Nataraj with his blissful consort, freedom, to the delight of his devotees, who are thus liberated forever. Unto that Ananda Natesha do we render our devout salutations. Ananda means blissful, and Natesha means the original dancer, the first dancer. So very appropriate that uh, he is symbolized by the Nataraj uh, statue yes. in the temple. Yes. Uh, the Nomi put the Nataraj on the cover of his Tamil translation of Song of Ribu, and that must be why. Well, interestingly, the traditional tune for these shlokams is uh, in the Rag Bhupali, which is the the cosmic dance of yin and yang. Uh, Perfect. And it represents, yeah, it represents perfection, <laughs> bliss, happiness, uh, the, the perfection of actually all existence. Yes. The cosmic dance. So it's a perfect, perfect thing. The whole introduction, the, the uh, introductory verses and the symbology and the music and everything. 
Yes. And uh, interestingly, the meter that's used for this these verses is called a sardula vikridita, and it's 19 syllables per line. And it goes long, 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 short, short, long, short, long, short, 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 long, 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 short, long, long, short, long. Da 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 and it represents a playful lion springing forward. Okay, so that's the lion. Yeah, that's where the lion comes into it. Okay. And of course, Mother Shakti is always yes. riding on a lion. Okay. Now, uh, when I went to India the first time, I went with a group that Nomi took. And one of the things that was wonderful about that is he would, uh, we would go into these temples and you know, I was just a guy from Silicon Valley, and I'm not used to all the murtis and the statues and all of the symbols. And Nomi would take the time to uh, tell us the meaning behind the symbols. And when you know the meaning, then I was able to uh, kind of greet the symbol in terms of its spiritual significance. Mm -hmm. And then instead of being some unfamiliar object, it was a friend. And ah, you, yes. You know, you could, you knew how all of these symbols were uh, supporting you and your practice. Yes, I got that training from my Adi Guru, Srila Prabhupada. Okay. When I stayed with him in Vrindavan and, and in Mayapur, Bengal. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, there were many murtis in the temples in the, that we stayed in. And there were many, many temples in the area right. that uh, had all these statues. And when I came to South India, the first place I lived was Kumbakona. Kumbakonam. Okay is full of devotional art. And the, the temple's gates, the Gopuram, are literally levels upon levels and levels of statues. Mm -hmm. And each one has a meaning, yes. a significance, and they yes. all fit together. So they offer us many gifts and supports in our own uh, journey and search. It's, yes, that we're not alone. There yes. are many, many beings have, have trapped this path before us. Yes. Now, next, I'm going to go into uh, the few verses from the Tamil River Gita. Before I start, I want to talk a little bit, though, about how Ramana actually used this text at Ramanashram. In the days, the early days of Ramanashram, they did not have rooms for guests. So if you went there, you would be there during the day. And in the evening, you had to find your own place. And so in the temple were just Ramana in his attendance, essentially the residence of the ashram. And so after dinner, pretty much every night, they would gather together in a circle and for about an hour read from the Tamil Ribu Gita. What and, an experience that must have been. <laughs> yes. And Ramana would start the reading and then pass the book around uh, in the circle and uh, everyone would read from it. And Ramana thought highly enough of this text where he said, if you really can't practice, if you can't inquire, then 
just read the Ribu Gita every day and it will give you the same results. Wow. And what I found is that reading it aloud was the thing, not reading it silently to yourself. And uh, while I was living with Era Natula, then my wife and I in the evening for several years would read a few verses uh, from Song of Ribu uh, to each other, you know, kind of each night. And doing that, we went through the book several times, and it was really a positive experience. So I would recommend to any of the people who are listening that the Ribu is wonderful and very worthwhile reading, but read it aloud, even if you're by yourself. I don't know what it is about this reading aloud. You would know more about this than I. It's just something that uh, we discovered. Uh, well, it's to... simple. It's simple. When you read it out loud, you engage more senses instead of just you know looking okay. and hearing okay. it in your mind. You're also speaking and hearing with your ears. Yes. So the more senses that you engage in the process, then the more uh, impressions are generated. Okay. And it also makes sense if you read it aloud, uh, you read more slowly than you yeah. would if you're reading to yourself. And this reading more slowly really helps the absorption. And the expression and, too. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so let us now dive into it. Okay. And here uh, we are starting with chapter two. This is where the teaching really begins. And the Ribu Gita is a conversation between sage Ribu and a seeker Nadaga. And the particular version we're reading from is the Tamil translation of the Ribu Gita. It's not really a translation. They essentially rewrote the whole thing. Uh, a couple of hundred years ago. And this translation uh, was done by my teacher, Nomi, working with Dr. Ramamurti. So here we start with verse one. And Nadaga asks, best of gurus, who deserves to become the supreme Brahman by attaining the knowledge of that supreme Brahman. What is the requisite knowledge for that? What is my real unsullied nature? Please explain to me in detail the answer to this in the way in which the supreme Shiva expounded it. That sage Ribu appropriately replied. So th well, this is very interesting because uh, Shankaracharya's commentary on the Bhagavad Gita, uh, sorry, on the Vedanta Sutra, begins with almost exactly these same questions. Yes. Yes. Not a coincidence. <laughs> yes, not, not a coincidence. As I read the questions, uh, they seem like questions that I have wondered about myself. Well, anyone would. Right. Who comes in contact with this tradition. Uh-huh. And he says, you know, what does it take to do this? Uh, yeah. Part of it, right? What is it and what does it take? 
there are some qualifications. Right. Well, we'll get to that soon. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But the, me... the point is, you, you can't just walk in off the street and expect to realize Brahman in a weekend. Right. Or if you do, then you are one of those uh, extraordinary souls who did a lot of work before you just randomly walked in. Well, I don't know anybody like that, do you? Uh, I know uh, one of them, which was Nomi, who just had it ah. happen spontaneously. There was another one who was with know me who I saw the same thing happen to with her it happened after years of intense meditation which I think yeah. is a lot more typical it happens very slowly until it happens all at once right right and it was funny uh, when it happened all at once with this woman who is my friend it's like the individual character that I had known all those years just vanished. Yes, literally, that's what happens. Okay. That must be why it seemed that way. It's like hitting the reset button. <laughs> Start oh. all over again. Okay, rebooting. Yeah. Okay without that other bad program running. Right, right. We nuke that one and just go back to the original system. <laughs> <laughs> Unmodified. <laughs> yes. Okay, continuing along. Verse 2. This is Ribu speaking. Those who have obtained the four aids, and these are from another ancient teaching and they are discrimination or viveka detachment or viagra the six virtues or shot some pot and then the most important is desire for liberation or mumakshakva and I'll, i apologize for my uh slaughtering the poor Sanskrit words. <laughs> Next, Ribu says, by means of treading the right path without any blemish during several births, unattached to the results of that tapas, the intense practice of austerity, and who have attained purity of heart without any delusions by naturally rewarding to shravana, listening, and other means. Those other means after shravana are manana or reflection and nidhyasa or deep meditation so the means that he's talking about are first you listen or you read, then you reflect on it deeply. Uh, and this reflection is still a uh, cognitive, a mental process. And then you want to make it your experience. And to make it your experience, you take it to deep meditation and in that meditation turn what you were listening to into your own immediate experience. Then Ribu continues and thus reach the knowledge of the Supreme Brahman themselves become the undivided non-dual supreme brahman with no trace of anything separate from it so the knowledge he's talking about is not intellectual knowledge it's no. not book learning no it's direct experience yes 
And now uh, Ramana, Ramana said that inquiry was more akin to feeling than thinking. Yes, intuitive. And so again, the point of this is not to have these grand, wonderful ideas. Even the best ideas are only a fiction that is superimposed over your own being. Yes, the symbols. Point, yeah, the point is to uh, know who you are. And by that knowing, it turns out a trick happens. You become what you know. And that is kind of, that's what matters. Well, it's not exactly a trick. It's that you are that already. Yes. The trick you is know? hiding yourself. Yeah. How do you do that? <laughs> that's, <right. laughs> that's the amazing part. That's, that's the magic of Maya. Yes. 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 Now, one view of this that I had from the time that I was uh, an early teen 20s was uh, there was God by herself for this infinite, endless moment of joy. And then she said, shit, I'm bored. Let's go have some mischief. <laughs> Whereupon all of this was created, and the biggest mischief is she didn't tell us who we are. Yeah, and we we try to guess. Yes. Well, I'm in this body, so maybe I'm this body, or right. maybe I'm this stuff that's connected with this body. Yes. The different labels and and uh, symbols and attributions attached to this body. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's who I am. And when we struggle with that, because those things are just temporary and constantly changing. Mm -hmm. And don't so, bring us any peace. No, because we're always having to adjust to these changes that are happening. And we don't really know where they're coming from until we penetrate to the source, you know? And um, actually, I, I don't think it's out of boredom that she creates. I think she has a desire to entertain Shiva. Okay, okay. You know, to bring him out of his shell a little bit. He never gets to go out very much, you know? <laughs> He's in such deep stillness. In one scripture, there's a story about the demigods needed to see Shiva for some reason. And they approached him sitting in tapas in the Himalayas. And the stillness emanating from him was so profound that there was not a breath of wind, even way up in the mountains, and not a leaf was moving, nothing, absolute stillness. And so they, they were conferring amongst themselves and they said, oh, how are we going to get his attention? Because if we do anything to wake him, you know, he might burn us to a crisp like he did with Cupid. So they asked, the, they asked this little ant, a termite, you know, termites have very sharp pinchers, right? And they said, go and bite Shiva on the toe and wake him up. And the ant said, now, wait a minute. That's asking for trouble. <laughs> I guess ants in the, in the heavenly planets are much more intelligent. So he said, usually when you do a favor for someone, there's some compensation. So you, you have to offer me a boom. The demigod said, well, what would you, what would you uh, consider an adequate boom? That, he said, if 
uh, Shiva like vaporizes me. <laughs> that I would be born amongst the demigods for the rest of creation. That he considered that an adequate compensation. Mm -hmm. So Shiva is so wrapped in silence and ecstasy of awareness of his self, which he is the self, you know, as we all are, that he, he didn't really even want to come out of it. You know, so Shakti tries various strategies, you know, sitting on his lap and teasing him and, you know, playing jokes and dancing. And I mean, she does everything and anything to try to like bring him out a little bit, you know? And then they go, they get on Nandi the bull and uh, they go on a tour of the universe and they visit all the sages and one by one, they give them moksha. So they, uh, they engage in the pastime of salvation. The drama of giving liberation. First of all, they create the conditioned existence. And then one by one, they liberate all the deserving souls. Mm -hmm. So it's just up to us to make sure we are ready when they come. Yes. That is, you cannot attain enlightenment by doing something. Right. But you can prepare yourself to receive it when it is given. Mm -hmm. That's the purpose of sadhana. Mm -hmm. Very good. Let's go to the next verse. Verse three, negating all the illusory attributes like the individual and the supreme by clear inquiry and fearlessly realizing the undivided supreme Brahman as I am Brahman is the proper knowledge for attaining the nature of Brahman, those men of fortitude who are attuned to this knowledge of Brahman, faultless one, are never affected by the base bondage of worldly existence. Wow. But how many of those are there, especially these days, you know? I don't know, and I suspect that uh, many of them may not make their presence known. Yes. In Tiruvannamalai, there are many local sadhus, and some of them are extremely exalted, but they have such a humble demeanor. They don't expect anything from anybody, mm -hmm. and they live such a simple life i mean just sleeping on the sidewalks you know on the side of the street i couldn't do it uh, yes. when i was younger one time i went on a padiatra and it was a party very nice party we had a, a a tractor and two trailers you know those farm trailers that they mm -hmm. they bring the uh, sugar cane mm -hmm in from the fields but we had modified them uh, to be one was a kitchen and one was a temple and we had murtis and everything all the puja stuff it was amazing and we had an elephant so and a couple of oxen uh-huh uh four oxen i think actually it was quite a quite a party you know and uh I joined them in Hyderabad and we went south from Hyderabad. 
and um, it was rough. You know, we were just uh, put a, a sleeping bag on the ground, and that was that was it, because it wasn't rainy season. Mm -hmm. At least we didn't get rained on, but you know everything else, mosquitoes and dysentery, <laughs> you know, uh, all of the things that happen when you travel and live simply in India. And uh, I held up for about two or three months. Then I got so sick, you know, mm -hmm. I just, I had to drop it and go somewhere civilized. <laughs> but man, we had some adventures. Mm -hmm. Wow. We went to this one place just two or three days out of Hyderabad. And it was way up in the hills, the Vindhya hills, um, which is, by the way, the, the home of Shakti, the daughter of the mountain, you know. And uh, we came on this to this one place, it was like a mesa, this flat a table, ele elevated kind of table lamp. And man, this place looked like it had been hit with a nuke. I mean, seriously, it was like blasted. Nothing grew. There were some old, old ruins, you know, and but it just had this air of devastation about it that was so overwhelming. We were going like, whoa, what happened here? You know, I've been I've encountered a few places like that in India where there had been wars back in the days and somebody used a Brahmastra but anyway, some uh, traders came through on, with uh, a caravan of camels. Remember, this was 25 years ago, right? And uh, so we asked them, what about this place? What's the story of this place? And they said, oh, once there was a great king here and he was a great devotee of Narasimhadev. And so he built a beautiful temple of Narasimha and the worship, the puja was done very nicely for a, for a long time. And the village became very prosperous and grew and became a town and so on like this. But the king's son who inherited the kingdom was a rascal. And so he didn't keep up the puja. He disrespected the priests and, you know, caused all kinds of offenses and like this. And gradually the puja at the temple stopped completely. And so one night there was this incredible storm. And it was like, it was like the rain was falling in solid columns, like at the time of universal devastation. And, um, there were great roars heard coming from the sky, right? And lightning like was hit like a machine gun, bam, 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 all over the place. And uh, the few people that survived this who lived to tell the tale, uh, of course they immediately left and the whole place is abandoned. And so and it has never been settled again after that is cursed, right? And so the only building that's even, you know, partially left standing was the original Narasimha temple. But it has been completely taken over by cobras, king cobras. Nobody can even go near it. So you know, you see a few places like that. There's another place, Mount Abu in Rajasthan, right on the border of Pakistan, um, where you can see there's like stones, huge boulders that are have just been melted. Wow. You know, it's yeah, it's like if you took a scoop of ice cream and just kind of it just kind of melted, you know, and then you freeze it again. And uh, so there's a story that Lord Rama had a big fight with some demons up there. And the demons were coming in air cars, Vimana, and they were using Brahmastras. 
atomic weapons uh, driven by mantras. And so, uh, you know, everything was melting and everything, but Rama unleashed an arrow that poor, made a protective dome like around his people and uh, he saved them all and ultimately defeated the demons. So I'm not sure how we got started on that. <laughs> <laughs> but let us proceed then to Ribu. Maybe he knows. I'm sure he does. Yes. So verse four, Ribu says, your true nature is always the undivided non-dual Brahman, which is a mass of being, consciousness, bliss, motionless, ancient, still, eternal, without attributes, without confusion, without cheese, without parts, without impurity, completely free from any illusions of duality, full, peerless, and the one. Very nice. You know, he's, you know what he's talking about, sheaths? Yes. The co koshas, the five yes. koshas. Yes. Yeah, we went over that back in when we were going over uh, uh, the 20 verses on, 40 verses on enlightenment. Yes. Ramana's book. Yes. What's that? Uladu Narpadu. Right. 40 verses on reality. Yeah. That the human being uh, is like a composite of these mm -hmm. five sheaths mm -hmm. that cover the actual spirit or consciousness. Right. And then the gross body is the Anamaya Kosha, the food sheath. The subtle body is the Pranamaya Kosha, the energy sheath. Then there's the mental sheath, the mind, Manomaya Kosha. Then there's the intelligence, Vijnana Maya Kosha. And finally, the Ananda Maya Kosha, which is the consciousness, the, the being itself. But this Satchit Ananda, so this is the actual source. And Ramana said something very interesting once, where, where does happiness come from? And he said, it comes from when we momentarily cease to desire. I love this explanation that for a long time we're, we're, you know, maintaining this tension, this desire, this, this clinging to this yes. uh, imagined future. And then when that future actually arrives, if it does, if we have the karmic qualification for it, then at least for some time we drop that desire. And because the desire is in essence, a painful, stressful thing, when we drop it, that relaxation is felt as bliss, as happiness. Yes. But the happiness doesn't come from the thing that we desire. Right. It is our natural state, which is uncovered for a little while by the satisfaction of the desire. Yes. Now, Nomi, when he uh, talked about the four means and talked about particularly uh, the desirelessness after attachment, detachment, he talked about uh, one of the ways that uh, he would instruct us is to look within ourselves for the source of happiness. Mm -hmm. And when you discover that this source of happiness is within me, then this detachment 
really becomes natural. You know, why should you be attached to anything that uh, does not bring you the happiness? These things like the mind, the ego, the personality, the body, and so on, are actually far away from the self. Yes. They're actually outsiders or strangers. You know, this uh, inquiry started for me. I remember it very clearly. I was in Mexico City in 2005. And I was in the process of starting my ashram at that time. And I took a walk. I was sitting in a park. Mexico City has some very nice parks with gardens and like that. And I was thinking, how is it possible that the soul becomes attached to a body? <laughs> yes, good question. It's so different, you know. How can you even, how is it even possible to perceive a body? Mm -hmm. Right? And actually, that question remained unanswered until I read the Drig Drishya Viveka. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That explains it pr perfectly, how the, the light of the self is reflected in the mind and body and senses. And so they appear to have consciousness, but actually right. they don't. They're simply machines. They're yes. just, they're nerve. Yes. Now, uh, get, Nomi would talk about this life as self-effulgent was uh, his expression. And uh, this was clear. This was the light that lights of its own accord and in which everything else is illumined. It doesn't depend on anything else for right. its light. Right. Okay. And it's also, because of that, it's also self-revealing. Yes, yes, yes. All, All we, we have, have to, do, to do, is do is catch on. <laughs> yes. Yeah, just remove the covering. Yes, and it's there. Always been and always will be. Yes. And Ribu continues talking about who you are. You yourself are the Supreme Brahman, which is existence alone. You yourself are Brahman, which is full in all respects. You yourself are the Supreme Brahman, which is consciousness alone. You yourself are the Brahman, which is not associated with the world, the individual, or the supreme. You yourself are Brahman, which is goodness alone. You yourself are Brahman without name or form. You yourself are the supreme Brahman, which is only that. You yourself are the supreme Brahman, which stands alone by itself. That's very nice. And uh, within that, uh, they uh, cover what you were talking about after the last uh, slide. Uh, you are Brahman, which is full in all respects. You yourself are the Brahman, which is not associated with the world or the individual or the supreme. Or the supreme. That's right. That's unexpected. Huh? Yes. Because uh, so many teachings that identify the various forms of the supreme with Brahman itself. In fact, they say, you know, that Krishna, for example, is the Supreme Brahman. 
But actually, when you come to that platform, you, you realize, no, that's not true. That those forms are simply metaphors right. or symbols that we project onto Brahman. Because okay. Brahman is inconceivable and inexpressible. And so if you uh, can name it, it's not Brahman. Right. If you can perceive it, it's not Brahman. Mm -hmm. It's just a projection from your ego. Yes, but in the beginning of spiritual life, it's a necessary one. Because of the inconceivable nature mm -hmm. of Brahman. That if we hadn't didn't have anything you know to sort of hang our mental hat mm -hmm. on <laughs> we wouldn't we wouldn't be able to grasp it at all mm -hmm. so the scriptures give us these various forms and then allow us to uh, build a relationship with whatever one appeals to us that's why there are so many deities mm -hmm. so many different religions and practices and so on But in the end, ultimately, they all have to be given up. Yes. So one of the things Ramana spoke about self-inquiry as a practice, he said basically that the means and the end are the same. And by that, he meant, I think, in part, that this is an approach where you don't have to learn some kind of intermediate truth that you then abandon later as you're going deeper. Yes, because he was teaching on the Vivartavada platform. Yes. If you look in Guru Vachaka Kovai, verse 83, he, he literally states this. Mm-hmm. So although he didn't ever criticize bhakti or karma yoga, he didn't, when he was presenting his answers, he didn't really encourage people in that respect. Right. He was trying to get them to, to reach that platform of pure inquiry. Yes. Where the inquiry and the answer are one and the same. Okay, now let's go to the last verse for today. Okay. And the last verse continues Ribu's uh, exposition of who we are. You yourself are Brahman, which is like the sky with no form. You yourself are Brahman, which is the blemishless reality. You yourself are Brahman, which is a mass of knowledge. You yourself are Brahman, which has no world or any such thing. You yourself are the supreme Brahman, which stands as the void. You yourself are Brahman, which is the pure expanse of consciousness. You yourself are the non-dual Brahman, which is imperishable. You yourself are Brahman, which is complete, full, and undivided. This is so nice. Yes. And he says these things, not again, so we have some grand idea, but uh, point us directly to the experience that we can find within ourselves if we just bother to stop and look. And this is a very joyful thing. <laughs> yes. You know, when I first started reading Ribu Gita, 
In fact, I did a series on it about, I don't know, three or four years back, uh, readings from different chapters. Okay. And I would take it, I was taking it very seriously. <laughs> you know, this is heavy knowledge. And, you know, I'm using, I was using very kind of esoteric ragas and stuff, you know, and using my first thing in the morning radio announcer voice. <laughs> <laughs> but now when I looked into these uh, recitations of these verses they're done in Raga Bhupali which is the most simple clean and pure joyful Raga that there is you know it's just wonderful and it, there's no complications there's nothing heavy or dark about it. It's just pure bliss. So, you know, this is the actual mood. Uh-oh. Well, good thing we're on batteries because the lights just went out. The actual bliss of Brahman is there from the beginning. Yes. And it doesn't require like a long you know, heavy, dragged out kind of discipline. If you get it, once you get it, you're home. Yes. And the bliss that is there is the bliss who you always have been. Yeah, that's the miracle of it. Yes, yes. And it's just so amazing that we do all of this crazy stuff that avoids noticing what has always been there. For me, one of the keys to inquiry is this always. Looking within myself for what is always there. Yeah. And when I began, it was more uh, out of curiosity, if you will, you know, trying to see what is there. But as I uh, did it more and more frequently, what I knew within myself is there is something. I don't know what it is but it is always there and it is always the same. Uh, That's the self. Yes, yes. And uh, know me, once I figured out early in my inquiry to start the inquiry with just asking myself, do I exist? <laughs> What do you mean by I? <laughs> That's right. And what do you mean by exist? So it gives, right. you, it gives you two different ways to go with the inquiry. I checked with Nomi and he uh, said that that was a very good approach. And anyway, I've done this for many years. And, you know, what I noticed after a few years is every time I looked to see if I exist. I did. Hey, what yeah. do you know about that? <laughs> That's right. So a pattern. I started to notice a pattern. <laughs> I'm going to turn on my flashlight. Here we go. Okay. And anyway, so that knowledge that I have of myself, of what is always there has been such a solid basis for mm. uh, this ongoing experience. It's so simple, so direct. Yeah. Yes. And so know, available. Uh, but still, when, when we go back to the first verse, or the second verse, sorry, that there are some qualifications that one must have before this direct path 
or this direct insight mm -hmm. becomes possible. Mm -hmm. This is one thing I always want to stress um, so that people don't think I'm teaching Neo Advaita. <laughs> yes, yes. Good, an important distinction. Yeah, the qualifications, the background, the, the context has to be there. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, it becomes outward imitation only. Mm -hmm. And notice that, really that Ribu provided that context almost immediately when he started. Yes. And the same with Shankara. Mm -hmm. Shankara Chari. Yes. So the, the six qualities Shama, Titikshra, Karuna, uh, uh, Dhamma. Mm -hmm. I forget the other two. Titi but anyway, uh, uh, Titikshra tolerance, yeah. Uh -huh. Also, uh, Faith, Shraddha. Shraddha, yeah, yeah. So these things are necessary uh, to begin the, the serious study of Vedanta or non-duality. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why in ancient times, this was kept a secret. Ah, uh, okay. It was only given to those who were qualified. Mm -hmm. But now the situation is such, is so dangerous and extreme that basically the secrets are being shouted from the rooftops. That's right. And you can find them on YouTube and you can go pay $300 for a weekend retreat where it will be revealed <laughs> to you. <laughs> it pays your money and it takes your choice. <laughs> That's right. And maybe they'll give you a nice meal. <laughs> Oh, man, I'm so happy here. You know, in Sri Lanka, um, I've been received so nicely, you know, after being so isolated in Tiruvannamalai for five years mm -hmm. uh, with only a handful of friends. And here it seems like everybody gets where I'm coming from, you know. Uh, they all have that independent spirit of inquiry um, and they appreciate the kind of things I'm talking about because they have some experience mm -hmm. themselves that these mm -hmm. groups and stuff are basically businesses you know so um, you know I've been so well received and the meals are just heavenly I mean really I mean the, the, the spicing and everything mm -hmm. is like Fantastic. I mean, today for lunch, I had lotus stems for a salad. And yesterday I had fried lotus stems with corella, you know, bitter gourd. Corella. Mm -hmm. Oh boy, what mouthwatering stuff, you know. And, and this goes on every day. <laughs> so I have my room and I, I get my meals. And everyone is so friendly and kind, and it's very affordable, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm thinking seriously to make this kind of my headquarters. Well, it sounds good, and especially what sounds good is being in a situation where people get you. Yeah. You know, so you're not some kind of funny stranger. Right. And Tiruvannamala, it was always, why isn't this guy a member of some group? Mm -hmm. As if it was, you know, assumed that that's the only way to do sadhana. Mm -hmm. Here, it's well understood by the Buddhists anyway, that the real sadhana is always done alone. Yes. In Just like we were talking about in one of these earlier sessions. Yeah. So it's not, you know, I don't dislike Tiruvannamalai. Mm -hmm. um, it's a wonderful place to do sadhana. Yes. But it, that's the point. It is not a place for socializing and being with a group and all that. It's a place to go alone and, you know, sit in a cave or a house or whatever you got mm -hmm. and, and do what has to be done. 
finish your business and, and yes. uh, get the realization. Yes. So, and then uh, when it has filled your heart, uh, it's always there, and you don't need to be next to the mountain anymore. The mountain is within. Yes, yes. You know that Buddhist koan first there is a mountain, then there is no mountain, then there is. We leave that for your contemplation. <laughs> or do you want me to explain it? <laughs> are we out of time? No, I think we are out of time and uh, so explanation, explanations are for understanding and understanding is the booby prize. Woo! You said it. <laughs> <laughs> I'd settle for some electricity right now. <laughs> well, anyway, we'll see. Right. We will see you next time, and it oh. was very good, as always. As always, and I have some ideas of verses we can do next. Okay, and I can come up with some more musical settings. Oh, that was very good. Yeah, I have the traditional style now. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we can do that. Okay, okay. thank you. One-handed pranam here. Yes. I'm going to hold the flashlight. <laughs> <laughs> well, the pranam I learned to do one-handed is like this. Oh, that works too. Yes. Om Tatsa. Om. Om Shakti. Namaste. <laughs>